Well, thank you for having me. Good morning, everybody. Um, the summary you received is already outdated because right now I, I moved to Radboud University in the Netherlands where I'm uh, starting up a new program in neuroengineering at the Donder Center of Neuroscience. Um, so there's a big commitment here in the Netherlands and the Radboud University to, to advance also the domain that we're busy with in, in rehab. Um, so uh, and sort of following up on the, on the previous talk, um, we of course also face the question, okay, but how are we going to deploy this stuff, right? These are all great ideas. We see the future. We, we see also what is possible, but how are we going, going to get there? Um, and that's a little bit what I would like to, to focus on. Also from the perspective of actually uh, having me very much involved in building up new neurobilitation technology for the last 20 years and also building a number of startup companies that have tried to deliver this to society. So in that sense, I would like to structure the talk a little bit around uh, the challenges we face, the fundamental uh, obstacles and challenges we have to overcome. I think to really realize this, the dream of rehype, as it also was summarized uh, to some extent in the in the previous talk and um, it's as always uh, it's much harder than you think um, but but it's not impossible but it, it requires uh, some serious work and uh, for instance just to tell you where we're coming from with the systems we we, we developed um, so here we have an example this is also something we have built inside the rehab project right we have the the mate of Volvo uh, and, and also where Osur is involved. On the left-hand side, we have one of the protocols of the rehabilitation gaming system, and we already merged them together so that people can. And also we did a, a little uh, user pilot at uh, Schoen Clinic with this system uh, to also show that we can effectively link these systems together and, and, and improve training. But um, the rehabilitation gaming system is a bit of a standard in the field, like. But today we think first person perspective in these track of training protocols is just given. But this has to be invented, right? When we started, actually third person was dominant. So you would look at the limp in a third person perspective flying through space. Uh, so this is one of the, the innovations we, we brought. Uh, also to have online adaptation and learning to, to the, the properties of specific movement characteristics of the user. We have introduced a long time ago, which is now also a standard in the field. But all these things that we think are just normal and standards and common all have to be invented and introduced and validated and fought over with the scientific community. Right? Um, there was an earlier speaker who mentioned that we don't want to have adaptive uh, technologies because it has a problem with certification. Well, that's not true, right? So this is uh, this is certified CE1. It's on track for FDA approval. These are these include adaptive components, and as long as you certify them pro properly, they can be brought out. And other adaptive AI-based techniques that are a bit more advanced, use more advanced user models, also would fall on the CE2 guideline in Europe. So this is these are not obstacles we cannot overcome. This can be done. It might not be true for these more complex modular robot systems. But it's not that there are no channels to, to include adaptation. But now um, I really would like, OK, why would you do this? And if you decide to do it, how would you do it? And what will it look like? Um, so there are different steps to that. Also for us, the anchoring point is stroke. Oh, Karma already introduced that to us as one of the main challenges for, for our society. But one thing that's interesting is that the largest economic impact and also social impact and, and, and individual impact for patients of stroke occurs in the chronic phase. So, so initially also I thought, well, look, the huge chunk of effort sits at the beginning, but it turns out that if you look at the loss of productivity, social care, informal care, and also healthcare, the biggest chunk of cost to our society sits in the chronic phase of stroke. And surprisingly, it's in that phase that actually a lot of support services and rehabilitation services are dwindling for the stroke patient. So it's really a gap in some sense in how we deal with, with stroke. And for that reason, the European Stroke Organization together 
with uh, the Stroke Alliance for Europe, which is more like a patient organization, also consistent with the World Health Organization's guidelines, has advanced what's called the Stroke Action Plan for Europe to say, look, we've got to improve this. This is a problem. Um, and this is the plan for 2030, as the title already suggests. But what's interesting here is their action saying, look, we, we want early support discharged, early supported discharge. So people should leave the hospital as soon as possible. And then we want to have community-based rehabilitation and self-management for a large part of the patients, right? So at least 20% of stroke survivors in all countries should be discharged early. And after that, for all patients who are discharged in that chronic phase, we should bring the rehabilitation home. Now, this is, of course, a great idea, but the point is we are already not treating patients really in that phase. So how are we going to do that? What are we going to do and how do we bring it home? And uh, what are the questions with that? Well, let's look at this from different perspectives. Um, so, so this is really for us that and when I speak of us, that means the research group and the associated spin-off companies like Eudyne and Sapiens 5, and then this whole network of, of clinical and also industrial commercial partners we have. This is really one of our strategic objectives, right? How do we bring rehabilitation home uh, before 2030? And on the one hand, you have to, of course, your, your patient journey you have to think about, which starts in the hospital, and then you have an inpatient, outpatient phase, and at some point you're discharged. So that also means in every phase of, of treatment, you might want to look at somewhat different interventions, somewhat different devices, and also somewhat different protocols. And there, I think there lays also an important question, how far can we push these highly sophisticated and complex devices uh, if you want to follow that whole patient journey to at home? And so I, what we have in mind is more also a hybrid approach where maybe in hospital, in clinics, uh, you will be working with more involved, highly specialized, also more e expensive equipment. But the closer you get to home, once at home, we should move to more consumer level electronics because these are really scalable systems. They're well tested, they're out there. And moreover, what's also important and was mentioned earlier as well, these are the devices patients are familiar with. Because one thing we see in the trials we do at, for instance, the RGS at Home project, if you add another device to a patient who's already trying to overcome a big challenge in their life as a stroke, and you say, okay, now you have to wear this device at certain points in the day, and you have to charge it and whatever, it adds complexity that very often is not really well accepted. So even though the perfect device might be a coma machine that you should park in everybody's home, it's not a realistic way to think about it, not only because of cost, but also of complexification of the, the living conditions of the patient. This is one reason why we also have to think about how can we make things portable, accessible, and understandable for, for patients. Um, for that reason, um, we have moved more and more to away from specialized devices to, um, so, okay, um, to um, consumer electronics, okay? So, that, okay, this is on the patient journey side. You have, you have interventions are adapted, but also we have to slowly move, is our hypothesis, to, to easily accessible tools you can go to media market for to buy. But in parallel, of course, if you follow this patient journey in this way, we are also instrumenting patients and their environments more and more. So in some sense, our relationship with patients start to change, as is illustrated on the right hand side. So now patients and their, their support, uh, their social environment and their clinical uh, con their support, their therapists and their physicians are becoming part of a data pipeline. Right? So this whole patient journey idea starts to map to how we're going to structure the technology and especially how these technologies are interfaced to each other. And these, these issues are following a, a next uh, challenge. So here's an example how we envision that in some of our projects. I will elaborate a bit later. But now we have to think about a patient in the loop system, where if we go from the top right to the, to the of maybe you can see the cursor now. If we go from the top right clockwise around this circle, we have a patient. The patient, of course, on the one hand has a lot of 
dedicated, often high volume data that relates to the clinical assessment in the, in the hospital. Now, this data has to be integrated with the kind of behavioral data you pick up during the 24-7 monitoring at home or when there is in the out inpatient phase. So this raises question one. How are we going to integrate all these, these different sources of data? Secondly, once you have it integrated in whatever form you choose to do that, of course, how do you store it? How are you also GDPR compliant? All these other issues around data security. But then how do you actually build on that data for the clinical decision making? So how do you now bring also the clinical staff into that loop to, to manage the data? I mean, if I, if I gather more data and I just dump it on the desktop of a clinician, it means way more work for them, which they don't have bandwidth for, right? So there is a huge challenge of how do we not only integrate the data, how do we make, compress the data so it becomes actionable data on which you can make a decision on a, on a change in, let's say, an intervention. So, and then another issue of course, in, in already in stroke, let alone with other neuropathologies, our prognostic tools are just not great today. There are many, we, we cannot really predict what the status of a patient will be a few weeks or a few months into the future. So this raises that whole question of, okay, but then how do I map my current understanding of the status of the patient and what should be done onto the possible impact of the changes I will make to the protocols that are delivered at home. And then the last step, then um, whatever the decision-making process has been, config the configuration of an intervention system is changed. This is delivered to the patient. We're now again at the top of our cycle and the patient is acting within now a changed protocol, diagnosed probably differently and new, a new data cycle sets in motion, right? So we have to now think about the, the discrete interventions we are developing also within this loop of, of human performance, human decision-making, and especially data, data integration, interpretation. So uh, we have started and one specific, now we, now we zoom in on this one step of this. And that also was mentioned earlier, which is the digital twin. How do I model the user? How do I model the user in the sense that I can support the clinical decision making? But also how do I model the user so that I can um, advance my prognostics? So there are different challenges in the user modeling part of the cycle, and it's only one element, because then the other element might be, how do I inform uh, the clinician in, in an operationally effective way, or how much of that do I want to offload using more advanced AI tools? So um, we actually have a parallel project called Phrase, where we exactly address these challenges in parallel to the ones that, that we discussed in Rehype, which looks really more at how do we use exoskeletons and FASTs to support the recovery process. But in par parallel, we are building a pipeline that can cover this whole cycle at sort of an industrial scale level. But on the one that we work with eBrains, which is uh, preparing itself to become the reference European infrastructure for all uh, brain data. Um, from there, we work with an AI company called Settle Point Science to use transparent AI methods to improve diagnostics and prognostics. Already have some extremely promising initial results of how we map basic activities of daily living into clinically understandable outcomes, like for instance, the Fugelmeyer scale or Bartel. Um, so this is ongoing work already. And then another issue that I want to bring up that is interesting for our discussion as well, the patient model, the, the, the so-called digital twin. So what we do there, and that's the work with Charité, is to look at the patient, not only as a collection of data points, but as data points integrated into a model of that patient. So we really want to, are using now whole brain modeling techniques to simulate the brain of the patient, including the lesions, to derive already also diagnostic information from that in terms of long-term development of, of the symptomatology. And, and one feature that makes the modeling so important 
are phenomena such as diastasis, on which we recently published a review paper, because local lesions lead to global changes, and the global changes impact the overall if you want, homeostatic regulation of the interaction between the, the sub-circuits of, for instance, the neocortex. So local lesion, global change, reshaping of functional networks is what we have to understand, and this is then going to be advanced through brain models, uh, whole brain models, and it's a combination of these streams that then provide on the one and operational information to the clinician, but the clinician in this loop is seen more as a supervising, or as a supervisor of a process that is largely driven through AI techniques, because um, we have to increase the autonomy uh, of, of this pipeline in order to just be able to, one, deliver the services we promised in this stroke action plan by 2030, but also to overcome, of course, what's called a data deluge, the overflow of data that no human can process, right? So we have to proactively engage with these different aspects of the stream, AI-driven and also uh, whole brain modeling based. Um, and then, so at Donders, where I'm resided, we look at uh, the linking of the brain theory to the neurorehabilitation to have, let's say, scientifically grounded decision-making on the intervention protocols and then Eudine, our spin-off, is, is, is also the commercial endpoint. And that means if you want to bring to society uh, a new solution, you cannot just go from the lab to a patient in some sustainable way, right? We need specific channels for that. So for us, Eudine and Sapiens 5, the spin-offs, sit in this broader set of stages that you have to go through to get from the basic science to patients in, in a scalable way. Um, so another example of, of autonomy we need, I will not expand on this too much, but I want to alert people to it, and I would be happy to follow up on, on our exoskeleton friends in Rovo. Um, um, so exoskeletons have to provide support to the patient. But right now, we, we still are very dependent on, on also the core capability with the mate, on the, on the core capabilities of the patient themselves to actually obtain the support that the passive exoskeleton can provide or the active skeleton uh, exoskeleton. We can also look at the FES uh, stimulation. How are we exactly going to decide on, on, on the parametric control of the stimulation? And there, what I would argue for, and that's also what, what we're trying to develop, um, is to, to also link uh, the exoskeleton FES compound to more biologically compatible learning systems. In this case, in particular, we look at uh, the cerebellum. The cerebellum is tightly uh, interfaced to the frontal cortex in, in, in also managing, if you want, the different time frames at which behavior unfolds. And the cerebellum also, in turn, sends back information to both the, the frontal cortex and the basal ganglia to then further modulate and fine tune how goal oriented behavior unfolds. And the proposal hypothesis here is that by capturing these principles of motor control, which are expressed on the right hand side, at least this is our hypothesis on it, um, can help us to find better compatibility between the, the intention of goal oriented action of the human user in such an exoskeleton and the actual support they will receive. So we need really a brain compatible controller in between uh, is the prediction. If you look at the right hand side, um, the big change we made there, if you, if you really look at the anatomy and you look at the physiology of the cerebellum, prefrontal cortex, key feature of that is that it, it is not a standard um, feedback error learning system, and which would go back to Kawato, right? In that case, you would say, well, I have a, I have a reactive feedback controller, there's an error signal, right? And then I just learn from this error signal to overwrite the feedback controller. So I get now an, a, a staggered hierarchy of feedback controllers, the first one predefined and the rest learned on top of that with each overriding the other. So that means you lose the feedback control component to go to the feed forward mode of control. However, these controllers, uh, even though well accepted in the literature, have big problems and the world is not fully predictable. 
And we already know that if you bring a, a person in the real world, the real world is only partially predictable. It's filled with unpredictability. So these controllers won't scale to that situation. So really advanced a few years ago. Um, an alternative perspective that overcomes that problem of dealing with only a partially predictable world by looking at these, these controllers as being synergistically coupled through what we call error signals, right? Learning in feedback error learning is driven by the error signal. And what we do now, we sort of co-opt lower controllers in the hierarchy by sending them virtual counterfactual error signals. So that means you can always deal with exceptions because the feedback controller that sits at the base of this pyramid is never disabled. It's always present if there's an exception. There might be a short anticipatory response to that, but then a rapid recovery because the feedback controller is still in the game, which is not the case for standard solutions. But it's just an example to say, if you want to go this route, bring the exoskeletons home, bring them more into the real world for activities of daily living, we also have to build supportive brain compatible control systems that can make that really happen. Um, so then the, okay, we're having a slow computer, so let's see how quick it will be with this uh, transition here. Um, then the user experience and the devices. So earlier you also saw an example of, of how augmented reality can be brought to people with, with uh, an AR uh, glasses or head mounted display uh, and other tools. But we have in integrated that approach uh, and this is uh, deployed by Eudine and Sapiens 5 in together with this notion of delivering services to patients using consumer electronics, right? So here we just, use a mobile phone to make the tab. But what you see here, we actually use the mobile phone also as the tracker of the movement. So now the, we have uh, the mo motion capture through the same device as through which we deliver an AR or VR experience of the environment. So this, this gives us really lightweight uh, access to the rehabilitation process uh, with the patient's home. And this system is already in use, actually. Uh, and we also have just released uh, months ago the Ukrainian version, which is now in use in a number of hospitals in Ukraine. Um, and why I mentioned that is that uh, because we have been focusing on consumer electronics, integrated data pipeline and decision making, so on, we could very rapidly respond to this challenge. And I think this is also an important challenge we all face, right? If, if in these emergencies, we, we must be able to deploy our solutions. If that's not feasible, then are these the right solutions, right? So this is another reason why, why I really insisted we do this fast. So the whole team of Eudyme switched gears for a few weeks to just get this done. Uh, so now it's out there being used. So this is a good example of how we can bring technology home uh, easily accessible through consumer electronics, and basically anyone now can use it as long as you have a phone. This doesn't mean you can do everything that might be needed, but a lot of diagnostics and, and delivery of, of rehabilitation protocols can be taken care of in this way without any further bottlenecks of, of specialized, specialized equipment. So it illustrated very much this whole point of really standardizing our interventions on, on low-cost consumer electronic uh, systems. Um, so, okay, RGS is now in use in many systems in many hospitals across Europe. So now also in, in Ukraine, we have other versions as well, just for for the clinical desktop, which is also installed um, with Schoen Clinic and and other partners in in this project. Um, so we're very happy with that, and of course we want to learn from from the use of of that system because all we're looking for is scalability, and we're also planning a 1000 subject trial across across Europe in the coming on in the coming years. But the last topic I would like to uh, breach is really the, the, the fun, most fundamental one in my perspective, which is okay, great. We want to bring rehabilitation home. We have technology, uh, we have internet, we can do stuff. But in the end, what are the principles of organization, right? What do you want to do exactly? And why would you do it? If you say social interaction, why? Is that pure motivation or is it for other reasons? Uh, and if it's motivation, then we can have the discussion, are you making the claim patients are not motivated to recover? 
If they're not, they're obviously, they're probably depressed, but then they need to get other, other interventions and, and there should be a diagnostic that, to make the differentiation, right? So I think there's what's underestimated. We, we throw a lot of technology at people, right? So uh, that's also how coma started with, with the locomot. It was a great idea, but in the beginning, it was not the case that its clinical efficacy was proven in that sense. That no, was just a good idea to try. Right, and so many things can start, but I think right now we're in a different situation in the field, also in the, in the state of technology, that we can say, what do we know about the brain? What do we know about patients and their needs so that we can really design our technology, build the, the technology around very specific principles of organization of the brain. And um, now one thing, so here I compare two kinds of patient journeys. On the top is the one that's largely uh, the case today, and at the bottom is the one we want to achieve uh, within within this broader RGS uh, perspective. On, what happens is that majority of patients after discharge uh, receive little support and 80% of functionality is lost after discharge after a few years, which is also called rehabilitation in vain, like people recover. First, people also recover because there's spontaneous recovery after the stroke. People then further can recover because of the interventions we give them. But we also know once they go home, the majority of that is lost rather quickly. So it means the at-home phase is really the big challenge. And we now also know, as we saw earlier, that is where the most of the cost sits of, of, of the stroke challenge to European society. So how we envision that is that um, we have to build more specifically on very core notions of brain organization, like use it or lose it, right? The brain can be seen as a muscle in some metaphorical way, but we do know that neural pathways are built and collapse dependent on their use. Look at the classic Rose type of poor and rich environment experiments and the, the huge differences that instills in, in the morphological structure of the brain. Right? So the brain also reflects the environment to which it is exposed. So this is something we have to build on. So in our vision, and we have already quite some data to support this, we really have to rethink this chronic phase as rehabilitation as a lifestyle, to integrate the rehabilitation process in your daily activities, to push the use to lose it, and set in motion a virtuous cycle of improvement as opposed to this vicious cycle of, of decline. So why do we believe this, this actually works well. Uh, the vicious cycle is, is, is well documented, like what I just told you, the rehabilitation in vain, or uh, the difference between readmission prevention for people who receive rehabilitation or not, or uh, in the EXCITE trial where uh, patients were followed, to see at the bottom of this slide, where patients were followed who would either be active in, in their daily activities or not, and displaying a clear a correlation between initial activity, overall activity, and decline or gain of function. But th these are more indirect correlations. We have targeted those very specifically in a number of domains of both, uh, let's say, the chronicity uh, of stroke. So how many, what's the period post-stroke that you can still see functional change with the kind of rehabilitation protocols we deliver. And we, we have shown in a 2019 paper that this extends way beyond the, the 12 months um, after which patients are, are discharged. You, this doesn't mean that the impact of your rehabilitation is the same. No, there is indeed some sort of higher sensitivity at around six months uh, post-stroke, but it is not the case that there's no sensitivity later. And that's something we can capitalize on in that chronic phase. We also have seen that um, by manipulating the goal setting of patients, that's in the acquired non-use case, and maybe I say something about it later in a bit more detail, by manipulating the goal setting of the brain, so not just looking at the periphery, but really how the brain processes goals and error information, as I was early also sketching out when he spoke about the counterfactual error, you can overcome acquired non-use in two sessions of 100 trials each. So it's not always about the periphery. It's about engaging with the goal setting of the brain and in that way, allowing it to link to the world and sample the signals it needs to reestablish uh, functional reorganization. 
And a very concrete example of this virtuous cycle we found in the application of these training principles in aphasia, which are also both different solutions. Um, so what you see on the right hand side, um, in, in, in purple is the control uh, group that received intense uh, language therapy with a human therapist. And in green, you see the patients working and now in a diet patient to patient in a, in a reaching and naming task, which is very different from standard treatment. And what we see in the long term follow up is that, uh, so that's the, the last part of this histogram, is that the patients who were exposed to this more goal oriented and action based rehabilitation we delivered through virtual reality protocols showed in the long term follow up still a progression improvement of function as opposed to the control group that was slowly uh, returning to, to baseline levels. And so th this was a direct illustration with other examples also in motor learning and, and cognition, but I think this is a very clear one for, for our discussion today that uh, engaging that virtuous cycle, for this case, we, we trained people not only for naming objects, but we also trained them into maintaining interaction and dialogue. And we capitalized on how action drives reorganization as, as Friedemann Pulvermüller, for instance, has shown very clearly in its analysis of, of language recovery. Right? So um, principles matter then. Um, and that's, I think, for, for the rehype uh, discussion important because we have periphery, we have exoskeletons, we have FES, and then we have the brain. Right? So how, how do we now combine these two factors in, the, in optimizing recovery? Because in the end, it's the brain that we want to change. Right? We don't need to grow more or less muscle in, in the end. Of course, you need them, they're a necessary condition, but our target is really the functional organization of these brain networks. So we have to be also brain-centered in how we deploy our, our principles. Now, for us, the brain is like a control architecture. That's how we look at it from, from also a theoretical perspective, where these different layers of control from fast, reactive, primitive, to very advanced, deliberate, uh, cognitive, and social are in a continuous balancing act with each other to, to grab control over, over the skeletal muscle system. So from that perspective, um, we have entered a lot of modeling studies. This will be short, it's just to give you a feeling how we ended up with a, with a core idea. Um, we started to look at, for instance, spatial learning, and we built robots, we built models, but there was a very a core insight that came from that. And that core insight is that the action itself, to be active in space, is a very direct modulator of, of memory and, and, and performance. This was a, and we have tested this on rats with Edward Moser, you might know him, he won a Nobel Prize in 2014 for his work on the grid cells. Um, so, action is, appears to be a very strong modulator of memory and learning in the brain. And that's, of course, what we have been exercising with our rehabilitation gaming system protocols, because it's embodied action in a task space. And so here, here we see what I mentioned earlier, the, the co intention compatible movement amplification is, here with Belen Balestero, did the work, is active engagement with a task. And in this case, we actually manipulate the error feedback to the brain as if the paretic arm is actually better than, than it really is physically. Um, this is also now a notion I see appear at also with other uh, players in the field. But again, this is where it was invented. Um, all these ideas have to come from somewhere. And it came from these, these computation models we built uh, before, that, before that time. So you see the result, right? So we have uh, baseline measurement, we see a, a bias of about minus six in hand use when you reach for targets. Uh, after intervention, so this is actually a hundred trials with this amplification uh, activated. We see symmetric hand use, we have a zero degree bias. And after the washout, another hundred trials, there's still a residual effect. Actually, the real problem we have here is long term retention. And that's where we are now in discussion with different partners about let's say, uh, also to combine this intervention with ph pharmacological uh, modulations, hoping to achieve better long-term retention than we, but we, we do have the effect of the functional training by manipulating the goals of the patient. Okay, there are lots of uh, references. This is show that we have performed 40 clinical studies to nail these principles. 
And this also brings us to a very natural link between the core objectives of Rehype and the, the principles behind this RGS system and the theories behind it, which is activities of daily living that we want to realize are goal-oriented actions, right? You have instrumental activities of daily living and they are even more complex, require more cognition, but dressing, feeding, mobility, transferring, washing, and so on are goal-oriented actions. And we know, and we hypothesize, and later I will give you uh, some more data on that, goal-oriented action will be the key driver of functional change in the brain, right? This is, and this is how you set the motion is our hypothesis, this, this virtual cycle. So that's why this linking between these core principles of learning and ADLs makes complete sense. This is, this is um, completely defendable. And what we already see here, we have a study from 2013 with patients using our, our healthy subjects in the scanner, using these first person embodied protocols. This is a reaching task that to reach for spheres that fly in space and they can gain points with that. And if you look at the distribution of, of activity in the brain, um, it largely engages with, with frontal parietal networks that underlie uh, volitional action. So this is a further hint that when we engage with these tasks that we deliver in this form, it's not very localized activity that we drive, but it is a more global activation. And from that, of course, then the question became, how does this exactly work? Um, how does the brain organizes itself when it engages with goal-oriented tasks as opposed to having no goal? So for that we went, and this is the last part, and then, then we can we can talk a bit more about these principles. I'll be quick here. Um, we went to epilepsy patients that were implanted with a depth electrodes. So we have local field potentials of these electrodes, and we posed a straightforward question: What is the response of the, this brain or these brains over these dozen uh, patients when they engage with a task actively or passively? So we really manipulated the goal orientedness of their action. And we did that in the following way. Okay, here is Diogo uh, Santos Pata, one of the postdocs who was doing the work with one of the patients. Um, and what we did, patients were sitting in front of a screen. They were navigating through the environment. They were asked to go to the red blocks. And at these red blocks, they would get a picture. And the task was try to remember the pictures because afterwards we're gonna ask you about them. Do you remember them or not? Um, and then the manipulation was basically either through a game controller, you could control where you were going. So this was the volition condition. Or in the other block, you would be on the trajectory of somebody else. So that means it's a very plausible trajectory. Humans have generated it, humans like you, but you are not the one pushing the buttons on the controller. So we removed the, the, the vo voluntary component from that. Uh, at the bottom, you see some rough correlations between the signals you get, but it won't tell you much. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of variety there. And one thing that we observed, so if you look at the panel C here, um, on the left-hand side, you see basically the activity in the hippocampus, core uh, memory structures in the brain during this task. And if you compare this activity in the hippocampus, then what you see in the active case, this is the darker blue uh, channel in panel C, we have a, a strong modulation of the frequency of the responses in that structure around three to eight hertz. It's also called the theta uh, range. And you see the passive case, when you take out the volition, this, especially in this range of frequencies, is diminished which is on the one hand surprising, no one had seen that before in, in the human brain, but it, it matches really well what we know about the red brain when they run around in an environment. So then the next thing we did um, is to understand these activity uh, uh, ranges better, like how is brain activity organized? If you just project the frequency of responses over the brain, it won't tell you much. It looks, uh, yeah, it, it blinks a lot. So what we did then is reinstatement analysis. And reinstatement analysis, I will just give you the concept. Uh, it takes a, as a feature vector, it takes a distribution of frequencies over all the contexts you have in the brain. Um, 
um, it takes the feature vector of all the, the responses in the brain and um, of about, let's say, 50 milliseconds. Uh, so from that, you get a descriptor, we see the left hand side, of how the brain responds to a certain event or an image. And then you pose the question, how well does this feature vector now correlate when you recall the same image? So in the end, you just look at the correlations over time between how the brain responds in the frequency domain to the different images. So this is called reinstatement analysis. And the metaphor is basically it's the, the brain is a choir. Every contact in the brain is like one voice. This voice sings a certain melody. And the basic question you try to quantify here is that voice singing the same melody when I encode, when I learn a stimulus as when I recall it or not? So this is what we're looking at. We look at how these voices are the same or different over time. And what we see, and this I think is really a very strong bit of data that, that we published uh, last year, but it gives us very strong support for this whole argument about why the goal orientedness of action and ADLs are the driver for the virtuous cycle. So on the left hand side, we see this correlation between the songs of the brain, between encoding and retrieval. And you see a very strong correlation, right? The more red, the stronger the songs are the same. And these are done over all the contacts you see in the brain. And in panel F, you see all the contacts. So this is hundreds of contacts we are analyzing here. And you see there's a global song emerging across this context. So the brain is globally replicating its state so there's a global coupling between all these contexts. And in the passive case, where you take away the volition, the goal setting, this, this collapses, right? This, this global coupling is largely uh, absent. So this is, uh, of course, we came a long way. We had first a theoretical idea that, that action and goals modulate learning. We tested that in the, the rehabilitation system that we built. And now we really have very direct neurophysiological evidence from the human brain that indeed action is a massive driver and goal-oriented action is a massive driver of, of learning and memory and overall information processing in the brain that we can build on with our interventions, also confirming the earlier work by Friedemann, Friedemann Pulvermüller. So to get them to the conclusions, actually when we put this patient in exoskeleton in front of a treatment protocol, uh, we see that the technology between the two is actually our big challenge and we become more challenging where we also have to think about more autonomy for the different components of the pipeline, more theory based also data integration and, and interpretation and also a strong emphasis on uh, let's say a clear eyed view on what are the exact principles we want to deliver. Right? Do we want to deliver something that we think is cool and then we say it motivates the patient or can we go beyond that? And what I showed you, this took us 20 years, okay? And I know we're slow, okay, so be it. It took us 20 years to translate that intuition about the effectivity of goal-oriented action into real proof that it makes a difference for the brain. And I hope we can be faster with other principles, but I do feel it's absolutely essential to avoid throwing a lot of noise at patients that will not be beneficial for them and also not for European society. So if we want to deliver the rehype dream, we must integrate also the devices, the exoskeletons, the FAST systems to these more advanced data integration and, and interpretation and control algorithms that, that are under development. Of course, maybe not for the success of the project, it has other priorities. But in this long-term perspective, these are the bridges I think we really have to build and I hope we will have time all together to discuss this and, and work on that. So uh, with that, I think this was the group when we were still in Barcelona. Uh, many of the collaborators um, have also gone to different places by now, but especially Belen Rubio and Martina Meyer, uh, Kike, is, who's, uh, who's with you actually, Martinez, uh, Ana Moura has done a lot of work, um, Claudia Cachuta, and, and uh, of course also Hector Lopez, who has done a lot of work with all the interfacing between uh, between end users and these devices. And then the team that is not shown here is of course the whole team at the spin-off companies, Eodyne and Sapiens 5, who in the end, these are the 15 programmers and designers who really are pushing these tools now to a level of, of professionality so we can deploy them as we 
as we did in in case of of, uh, of the Ukrainian hospitals, right? We must be able to act fast if we want to make this stuff happen also before 2030. And just the last thing to mention, uh, I'm also coordinating a, a European university alliance called Neurotech. So this is the only, uh, now Europe wants to build European universities. Uh, we are building a European university for brain and technology called Neurotech EU. Uh, the project is now in the first phase with some important players. This is of course a growing network. And if any of you has an interest in, in joining this alliance, there will be only one alliance dealing with neurotechnology. Uh, please contact me because I will be very happy to discuss with you how we can also collaborate in that context and think about how we translate our knowledge and insights and uh, from and methods from a project of rehype into future courses with which we build the next generation of researchers who will actually make this happen by 2030 and beyond. So thank you all very much. I hope it didn't take too long. Uh, thank you again for the invitation and I'm sorry I couldn't be with you in person. Thank you, Paul, for this. Paul, for this. Um, uh, can you mute on your side when we are talking? Because we have this echo issue, probably. Okay. Uh, so thank you very much for your very enlightening and uh, and and uh, and good talk about what also is missing and what needs to be added. And and uh, I mean to have this included network uh, of, of AI technologies that needs to join together with the physical technologies that are developed. I mean, Rehype goes in this direction, but does not, does not go fully and very far in this, uh, in this approach, as you mentioned it, and, and are completely right uh, on that. Uh, but I think it's also uh, important to to look at probably what are the challenges there, because there are still many, many challenges on, on that side. Um, one question from my side to, to this is, uh, when we have this digital twins with this representation of what is ongoing in, in the brain of the, of, of, of the person, uh, how is that dealt in terms of, of ownership? I mean, is then the ownership of this abstract data still on the side of the patient? Or what is the action that the patient or, I mean, the user can do when this, uh, what has been created on the virtual side probably is wrong or can be even completely wrong? Can he intervene on that or? Yeah. No, Jerry, that's a great question. Uh, that we actually looked at. So, so on the one, we also checked with, we asked the patients who were in the task, right? And all, they all claimed they owned that virtual limb. And then we went to more controlled experiments uh, to test the same idea. And what we now have shown is that as long as there's a matching between an object and the intention of the user, even if it's disconnected, but as long as there's close matching between intention and action of that object, you will claim ownership. So ownership is sort of continuously graded, but modulated strongly by the intention compatibility. So, I, so we can manipulate it, so we can keep it plausible because you don't want to break, you don't want to break the ownership. But, but I feel very confident also with the data we have and it's out there in, in the literature, we can do this in a, in a parametrically controlled way. But we have to, but you're absolutely right. We cannot be naive about it and just do whatever and, and hope that people will still find it plausible. Because as soon as the brain falls out of that model of integration, you will also lose your ability to, of course, rebuild the functional networks. Okay, thank you. Uh, have any other questions here from the audience? Don't see directly raised hands, but I have seen that in the chat yeah. there is a question, comment question from from Peter Wolf that yeah. also is uh, with us uh, here. So can you see the chat? And yeah. can you show it here yeah. also on the screen? I can read it also. 
It's not. Oh, sorry. Chat. Yeah. Well, but Peter is asking for other approaches being more reasonable, but I don't know what he has in mind because well, my whole argument is what matters is that we give the brain goals. We challenge the brain to set up a goal, pursue that goal through action, and that with that we create the conditions for, for functional reorganization of networks. So I don't know what other interface uh, Peter has in mind, if he means maybe as an interface, I don't know, FAST or an exoskeleton, as long as it supports the ability to execute these goal-oriented actions. But for me, it means FAST and the exoskeleton should make you better than you are in some sense. This is how you drive this virtuous cycle. So uh, we, we should be, I think, a little bit pragmatic which interface we, we take, but reason from the principles and we take the interface that matches best. But maybe I misinterpret Peter's uh, command here. Okay, I mean, I mean, we know all Peter really well. So Peter, you can you can really also communicate uh, through through voice. <laughs> no, Peter doesn't like that interface. I think he wants another interface. <laughs> no, we indicated in the beginning that we will do this through chat and not through through voice, uh, as it is uh, is uh, public. Uh, I want to hear Part, but I think uh, is it is it possible that Peter can yeah yeah give me a second and... yeah hi Peter I think that I give you the control to unmute you sir do you want to say something so many thanks um, <laughs> to give uh, to have this opportunity. No, in, indeed, um, I fully agree with you um, to go for a pragmatic solution, but I had, of course, other things in mind because I thought uh, yet that you want to bring um, exoskeletons or some other devices to users at home. And there I was not thinking of um, brain interfaces, of course, but of um, devices that are integrated in the exoskeleton or even that you can even use in some cases variables to motivate them to do things because I, I think at the very end some or in some cases it's, it's all about repetitions and of course when you like you, you need a certain um, ability to use these devices at home um, so it, it was not probably we are talking about different fields of applications and I, of course, in my background is more on um, motor impairments or neuromuscular impairments. And there I think um, brain interfaces are somehow an overshoot, um, I would say. Um, ah, OK, no, Peter, I wasn't proposing that the intracranial electrodes would become an interface. That's just an experiment <laughs> for epilepsy patients, OK? Yes. And, uh, but we can, it would be really interesting to follow up. But one thing we should discuss definitely, because for me, repetition is the last thing you want to do. You want to set goals. And we've, we've shown it, like constraint-induced movement therapy gets a lot of repetition, but doesn't work very well. And the other thing I would like to discuss with you is under many circumstances, we will not be able to give people exoskeletons. We see it. We try to enter different healthcare systems in different countries. Cost is a massive issue. So even though for some patients we have to push for that and this must happen, we also need scalability and cost reduction. And right, so we have to find a, a portfolio of solutions that can help us to scale. And, and I think that starts with core principles and a very pragmatic analysis. Okay, what do we need to deliver that? Right, and if it's exoskeleton, great. But if it can be something else, also good. Yeah, I fully agree. But um, to point out the repetitions, what I mean is, uh, what we have observed is when we really bring now robots to people at home, um, there's really a link of um, yeah, if they are compliant or if they are willing to train. Uh, so in the end, some of them, okay, it's a nice gadget which I now have. And after two weeks, um, yeah, you give it up. You don't care anymore. And because there are many other issues. And, and I liked also the talk before with all the engagement, what you can achieve at home and how to engage people to stick on training. And I think this is currently one of the major challenges. But from us, and I'm more okay. coming from engineering side, I would say right. currently it's also a problem, not only affordability, but yeah, but that's the main issue. We, we don't have that many devices on the market that can really be used at home. 
Um, and so sure. it's Those needed. Peter, but then, needed. Okay, but then you mean really adherence, right? Do people adhere to the intervention? Yes. And I get it. But what and what we see in, in we run a Europe wide trial for at home rehabilitation that it's not completely finished yet. But what we see adherence is very high, um, except for the wearables, because people are not used to wearables. Oh. This is really interesting for adherence on the phone or a desktop. This is there is very, very good. But as soon as you go out of the expectation of the end user, there sits a real issue, and then, then you have to coach them a lot to keep keep, keep yeah, adherence high. Yes, but I, here I think I would be very happy to see then the results in the publication, because in many cases I think there's an inter, uh, investigator bias, because you have a setting and an intervention, so you have a clear goal and you motivate people, ah, when you do that, you will gain that. But we are also investigating use cases where you just, okay, the device has been sold, there's no more further interaction with any therapist or what so on. You use it like an e-bike or whatsoever for your home use. And then you see clearly a drop because well, there are other factors coming in there. And okay. Is, uh, just, a fair note, but to close that way. part of the story, we, we did double blind it in some sense that um, it is deployed and ran by local therapy staff. So, so we are not the ones executing the trial at the home of the patient. It's sort of, we are disconnected. So, the, yes, bias always a risk, but we try to prevent a bit of that uh, from occurring. Thank you. Anyway, Peter, it was great to see you, and we should follow up. Many thanks. Thank and you. Stop with the repetition. Thank you. <laughs>